Hey guys, Mr. Women here, back at it again with another one of our YouTube video lecture PowerPoint walkthrough read aloud things. Today we're going to go ahead and start talking about World War II. Lesson one, aggression, appeasement, and war. Um, World War II is going to be something that we're going to cover for a while. We're going to cover this for probably two packet cycles, so that's about a month. Um, we're going to go into super detail about some of the certain things. I'm going to try some new stuff. I'm going to send you guys some documentaries that you guys can watch later. If you guys want, won't be a sign. If you guys want to watch it, you guys can watch it. Um, some movie clips. I'll probably be, what, you know, trying to draw out some certain things and, and so on and so forth. But let's get started today. Uh, disclaimer, if you see me looking off to the side, is because I'm hearing noises in the classrooms next door, and there's no one there, and it is what it is. And... It's currently right now really late while I'm recording this, so there should probably be nobody in those classrooms, but I hear noises anyways. So if you see me looking over, it's because I'm expecting someone to pretty much be there in the class. So let's get started. Germany rebuilt its military during the 1930s in defiance of the Treaty of Versailles. Here, troops stand at attention during a Nazi rally, Nazi, Nazi rally in Nuremberg, Germany. Okay, so first, let's, let's just a quick little reminder of what the Treaty of Versailles is. At the end of World War I, the, the League of Nations, what it's going to be called, it's going to be called the League of Nations, is going to be a group of all of the nations that um, pretty much survived World War I. So it's going to be the United States, it's going to be England, Britain, Japan, so on and so forth, everyone who had anything to do with it. Um, slowly but surely, countries are going to start leaving that League of Nations. And the League of Nations is going to be the, the group of countries that is going to be responsible for the Treaty of Versailles. Now, the Treaty of Versailles is a treaty that completely ends World War I. It's also going to be the, the document that actually writes in paper, in constitutional paper, that, or in law, I should say, that states, hey, Germany, you did this, so you have to repay it doing this. Hey, Germany, you're... you're you're the reason why this happened. So as a result, this is how you're getting punished, right? So when we're kind of talking about this, a lot of the things Germany is doing is going to be in direct contradiction of the Treaty of Versailles. So for example, here in the Treaty of Versailles, it states that Germany couldn't have an army bigger than an X amount, right? It's a very small amount of soldiers. But Germany is gonna start, as it's recovering financially, economically, as it starts to recover, it's gonna start breaking those rules. And we're gonna see how, how the rest of the world responds to that. So let's get started here. Our learning objectives are gonna be to describe how the Western democracies responded to aggression, explain the significance of the Spanish Civil War, and understand how German aggression led Europe into World War II. Key terms, appeasement, pacifism, neutrality acts, Axis powers, Fra Francisco Franco, Anschluss, Sudetenland, Sudetenland, Sudetenland. Um, I'm not German, so I can't really say those words. And Nazi Soviet Pact. Okay, so first off, class, before we get started, when it says Western democracies or the West, class, we have to remember that the West is going to be considered everything West of pretty much Germany. Germany would be considered Western but pretty much everything west of that. So you're gonna have France, Spain, England, the United States, Mexico, everything on the west, right, of Western Europe. So for example, Russia, Japan, China, India, that's all to the east. So that will be considered the west. So when you're hearing about, oh, what Western democracies, we're talking about France, United States, Ger um, um, later on Germany, but not now because they're, they're the bad guys. But we're talking about, you know, France, Spain, Portugal, all, everything to the West, if that makes any sense. All right. So that's just every, everything together. So let's get started. A pattern of aggression. Throughout the 1930s, the rulers of Germany, Italy, and Japan were preparing to build new empires. After the horrors of World War I, the leaders of Britain, France, and the United States tried to avoid conflict through diplomacy. During the 1930s, the two sides tested each other's commitment and will. So we're going to try to do something differently in these PowerPoints. So I'm going to try to model these as, as close to the book as I possibly can. So you're, what you're going to see is on the left, you're going to have pretty much like an introduction to like the chap, like the sub chapter. And then on the right, it's going to be all of the titles for all the things inside of that sub chapter, right? So all of those other bulleted points. 
So for example, we're gonna talk about Japanese imperialism, how it grows, Italy and how they invade e Ethiopia. Hitler violates the Treaty of Versailles, reasons for appeasement, the United States remains neutral, and the formation of the Axis powers. So let's get started talking about all that. So let's start talking about Japan. Japanese military leaders and ultra-nationalists thought that Japan should have an empire equal to those of the Western powers. In pursuit of this goal, Japan seizes the Chinese province of Manchuria in 1931. When the League of Nations condemned the aggression, Japan simply withdraws from the organization. Slowly but surely, Japan started taking more and more of China's Eastern territory, regardless of Western protests. So one of the, th the interesting things about the League of Nations is that it's not going to be like the UN, like how the UN now is the United Nations is now, where it has actual political power. It could, you know, it could, <laughs> it could um, actually financially ruin a lot of countries. It has troops. It can actually go into there and say, hey, you can't do this. Here's, you know, UN troops and so on and so forth. The League of Nations can't do that. The League of Nations is, is extremely, weak, as we're going to see, is extremely weak. People are just going to be there and saying, hey, don't, don't, hey, don't do that. But no one's going to act upon it, right? So when, when the country is in the, the League of Nations, for example, Japan, and they don't like what they're being told, well, they just say, hey, I don't need you. I'm out of here. Peace. And that's what they do. No one else does anything about it. So they just leave. So slowly but surely, Here's a map about it. Japanese expansion before Pearl Harbor. So that's before really the United States version of the version, but the United States is tipping point into World War II. This is what they're going to do, right? Japan is this, these, these sets of islands right here, right? Slowly but surely class after World War I, they're going to start taking a lot of these German islands just throughout the Pacific right here, Micronesia, a lot of these smaller islands. What they're going to start doing class, however, is they're gonna slowly and surely start taking a lot of Chinese land. They're gonna go up into the Koreas over here and over here, and they're gonna start taking Chinese land. In Thailand, they start taking some of that. So if you look over here, right here, this is Manchuria. They're gonna slowly and surely start chipping away. China's gonna protest, right? At this time, China is, has right, no military you know, might. They're not gonna have a lot of uh, economic incentives for people to actually protect them. And so they're gonna be crying to the League of Nations and really the League of Nations isn't gonna be able to do anything. Um, the West is going to protest. They're gonna say, hey, Japan, stop it. Don't do that, bad. You're being very imperialistic. And ultimately they're just not gonna to wanna to do anything about it. Okay, so slowly but surely their empire is gonna grow. Now here's another picture of what Japan is ultimately going to look like. So if you look over here, right, this is going to be the, the farthest extent of the Japanese conquest up to 1942, up to where we, the United States actually starts fighting back in the Pacific, Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Front, right? They're going to lead, right, most of, you know, a lot of Southern China all the way down, pretty much to like Hawaii, Hawaii is like right here. All, the, all of that is gonna be under Japanese control. And then here class, you're gonna see how they start off in Manchuria. They start, start taking over parts of Mongolia. They're gonna you know, take Hong Kong and so on and so forth. Hong Kong over here, they're gonna start taking Hanoi and Thailand. They're gonna get to British Malaysia, the, the, the East Indies, the Philippines. They're gonna start just taking over everything. Now let's start, let's pivot back to Europe. Hitler violates the Treaty of Versailles. That's gonna be something he does a lot of, right? So get used to that. Hitler also tested the will of Western democracies and found them weak. First, he built up the German military in defiance of the Treaty of Versailles. Then in 1936, he sent troops in the, into the demilitarized Rhineland bordering France, another treaty violation. So class, demilitarized means there's going to be, let's say um, there's two countries that were at war and usually there's a border right between them, right? So what demilitarized means is usually when they're at war, all of their troops are gathered at the border. And that's bad for a lot of reasons. That's bad because tensions are gonna be high. That's bad because normal civilians can't live in those towns anymore because they're overrun by, by, um, by soldiers. And the economies of those towns can't do anything because people leave. When the military comes, people usually tend to leave. 
So that's going to ruin a lot of, you know, a lot of smaller economies throughout that area. There's going to be an area like that called the Rhineland, right, which is going to be demilitarized, which means you're not allowed to have soldiers in that area because it's going to raise tension. Well, Germany's going to go, eh, what are you going to do about it? And they put troops over there. And slowly but surely, they're going to start going over the border and they're going to start creeping more and more and start claiming more and more of the Rhineland as German territory. Now, that's a direct treaty violation. You can't do that. They're pretty much invading France, slowly but surely. Germans hated the Treaty of Versailles, and Hitler's successful challenge made him more popular at home. Now, why do the Germans hate the Treaty of Versailles? Well, class, after World War I, Germany is going to witness an economic depression. Um, the, the German empire and country is going to shrivel back to what it was, and the economy thanks to the Treaty of Versailles, is going to take a massive hit. It's going to take a huge hit. So what's going to happen is the League of Nations is going to say, hey, Germany, you have to pay back war reparations, which means, hey, you're the reason why we spent $15 billion on airplanes, right? You have to pay us back that $15 million. Or, hey, you bombed um, London, right? You bombed London and cost, it cost $15, let's say $15 million to, to rebuild London. Well, now you have to pay us back that money. Now, the Treaty of, of Versailles is going to be seen, you know, kind of retroactively. Like historians will look at it now, today, and say that the Treaty of Versailles was too harsh because it's going to lead to very negative views of the rest of, the rest of Europe. So when, for example... If you have, this is a very bad example, but try to, try to see if this, this makes any sense. So you're a child. You do something bad. Let's say you're, you're playing with your basketball, your soccer ball, your volleyball, softball, baseball, whatever. You're playing inside the house. You're, you're playing catch with yourself, I guess, right? You're bored. You're playing catch with yourself, throwing the ball in the air. Now, let's say you throw the ball in the air. You, instead of catching it, you, you throw it out a window, breaks the window. Now, let's say... Your, your mom or dad comes home, your brother comes home. They see that you broke the window, right, which costs money. And now let's say they, they, they sell your Xbox, they sell your, your curling iron, they sell your car, they sell everything that you own just to pay back that small windshield. Well, you could say, well, the windshield isn't thousands of dollars to replace, but who are you to tell your dad that that's not how much money you have to pay back, right? Does that make any sense? So when the Germans realize, hey, we don't need to be paying this much, we don't need to be suffering this much, because due to the economic crisis, a lot of the people are going to become peasants, they're going to become poor, um, there's not going to be enough money to be able to buy food, so they're going to be struggling as a country. And that's going to politically completely shake Germany to the core. Now, this is how Hitler's going to come into power. He's going to see this power vacuum, right? There's going to be no one really in charge and the people who are in charge aren't doing that good of a job in, in reviving German spirits and trying to revive the economy and try to rebuild after it was pretty much tore down by the rest of Europe. So Hitler's going to view this as an opportunity for him to, to take charge. And he's going to start pointing the finger at other people. He's not going to say, hey, it's our fault that we went to World War II. We're going to start blaming everyone else so that we feel better about ourselves. And that way we have a reason to, right, to bring us up out of the ashes. And he's going to point the finger at the Treaty of Versailles. He's going to say, hey, look, the, the Europe is against us. Right? Europe stacked the deck against us. Europe is trying to make sure that we never come back. When in reality, that's not necessarily the case. But looking back, right, you don't really want to punish a country that badly. Because one of two things happen right? You're going to get a Nazi Germany effect where they come back stronger and they hate everybody, or you're going to have a, like what, when France, what France does to Haiti, when, when Haiti gets its, um, its revolution we talked about, right? And they're going to just stay poor forever. And there's nothing no one can do about it. So one of those two things happens, right? If it's a, if it's a strong slap in the hand and you do, you know, do some economic restrictions, right? That's usually better, but not to the point where the Treaty of Versailles, what we did, not we, what Europe does to Germany. So instead of taking a hard stance, Western democracies denounced his moves and adopted a policy of appeasement. 
the Western countries gave into the demands of an aggressor to keep the peace, right? That's what appeasement means. Appeasement means, hey, you know what? If you stop what you're doing, you could go ahead and do it, right? If you don't do any worse, that's appeasement. Um, when a baby's crying and you want the baby to stop crying, what do you give them? You give them what it wants. And hopefully it stops crying. Hopefully it, you know, it, it figures out what it wants to do. However, class, with appeasement and what we're going to see with Hitler is, is Hitler's going to want more and more. And he's not going to be satisfied. He's going to say he is, but in reality, he's not. And he's going to constantly try to get more as much possible, more and more and more and more and more. And for a while with appeasement, the West is going to give him more, right? Stop. We don't want to go to war. We're tired of war. World War I was awful. We don't want to go back into war. We're tired of it. We want peace, 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 peace. Hitler's going to say, okay, well, if you want peace, give me more. And ultimately, it's going to snowball. Now, the reasons for appeasement, right? France was demoralized, suffering from political divisions at home. They could not take on Hitler without British support. The British, however, had no desire to confront the Nazis. Some even thought Hitler's actions were justifiable. Or what I mean by that was some people thought, you know, against the Treaty of Versailles, some people thought to themselves, well, that makes sense. That makes sense why they're so angry. That makes sense why they're making an army, right? That makes sense because they don't want to be held down, right? So they, they kind of understood why he was doing what he was doing, and they didn't really want to get in his way. And number two, in both France and Britain, many saw Hitler and fascism as a defense against the worst evil, the spread of Soviet communism. Because class, the, the direct enemy in, in their eyes, the direct enemy of capitalism, of what was happening in the world, right, during the Roaring Twenties, the exact opposite of that is communism. Right. If, you, if, if communism comes in here and changes everyone's ideology and changes the economy of certain things, you're not going to be able to have what people were experiencing in the 20s, the roaring 20s. You're not going to be able to see this massive economic growth. You're not going to be able to see any of that. Right. You're not. And the most important part of that is when you actually look into Germany, Germany's not very good. Right. It's very communist. People are dying. People are starving. There's, there's nothing there that you want. So if you want communism, if you want to stop the spread of communism, they're going to say, well, you know, fascism, you know, these people are very authoritarian, they're dictators, but their economy is good. Um, you know, it's not as bad as what's going on in Russia. And so they, they kind of try to justify it that way. Number three, the Great Depression sapped the energies of the Western democracies across the world. And many just wanted to get back on track economically. So, of course, class, after the Roaring Twenties, the Thirties hit, and there's going to be an, a major economic post-war uh, depression. People aren't going to have any money. People aren't going to have resources. People aren't going to be able to do pretty much anything. Um, it's going to hit the United States very hard. Of course, we know about the Great Depression in the United States. Um, but it's also going to hit a lot of Euro Europe for very, very hard. Um, jobs are going to disappear. No one's going to be able to have jobs. Um, they're not going to get hit with a famine the way the United States was but it's still pretty bleak. And the last thing people want to worry about is war, especially when they're trying to put food on the table, right? Especially when they're trying to get, you know, just a decent job. So finally, widespread pacifism or opposition to all war and disgust with the destruction from the previous great war pushed many governments to call for peace at all costs. Ultimately, this is what it comes down to. World War I wasn't that far away, right? It wasn't that far. It was less than 20 years ago at this point. And a lot of the people who are now in politics were at one point soldiers during the war and and they don't want to re-experience that they don't want to re-experience the horrors of the war um they they would literally do anything other than go to war right so they wanted peace at all costs because they saw just the the amount of destruction especially with the new technology they, they, they knew if there was another war on the horizon that more, many more millions of people were going to die. And they didn't want that because they saw what happened to the countries right after World War I. Right? England was devastated. France was devastated. France never actually kind of never really fully recovered. Um, the United States, right, luckily wasn't necessarily in the war the entire time. But still, a lot of the soldiers that did come back to the United States, right, they, they were traumatized. Um, and they don't want that to happen again. So let's talk about Italy, Mussolini, specifically in Italy. In Italy, Mussolini decided to act on his own imperialist ambitions. Seeking to avenge the Ethiopian defeat at the Battle of Adoa in 1886, Italy invaded Ethiopia. 
Although the Ethiopians resisted bravely, their outdated weapons are no match for Mussolini's tanks, machine guns, poison gas, and airplanes. Ethiopian King Haile Selassie appealed at the League of Nations for help. The League decided that they were going to stop selling weapons or other war materials to Italy. However, those sanctions did not include petroleum, which fueled modern warfare. Lastly, the League had no power to actually enforce those sanctions at all. And by early 1936, Italy had conquered Ethiopia and had a new colony in Africa. So Mussolini, Mussolini Benito Mussolini, it's going to be something, someone we are going to actually look more into detail about later, is going to be a fascist leader in Italy. Um, he, he's, kind of, he's going to try to, um, how do you say, try to provoke a lot of the old Roman mystique. He's going to, you know, kind of hold himself to that Julius Caesar, I am a conqueror, I am the next does that make any sense? He's going to try to try to pr portray himself to Italy as being the next great emperor, right? I am Mussolini. I'm here to, to create a new empire for a new Rome for Italy. Um, for his benefit, Mussolini is going to look around and, and realize that he isn't all that. Um, Italy isn't necessarily all that. So when Italy looks around and they start thinking to themselves, okay, well, what can we conquer? If we want to be this, this new Rome, we want to expand our empire. Can we go to the West? Can we go into the rest of Europe? No, because Germany's there, right? We can't take France. We can't take England. We can't take, right? We can't really do anything. Well, what about to the East? Can we go into Russia? No. Can we go into China? No. But what if we go South? What if we go to Africa? Is there anyone there? Answer is no. So Ethiopia is going to be a country that, like I said before, famously never, never, for whatever reason, ever during African um, imperialism, colonialism, they never got, in, they never got invaded. Um, people tried, Italy tried, and they lost. Oh, let me go back. And they lost. Um, of course, class, I kind of I mentioned it last time we talked about them. Ethiopia is going to be the only Catholic you know, Catholic, major Catholic country in Africa. So people are going to kind of try to attribute it to be like, you know, you see, they're not, they're not Muslim. That's why they, they, that's why they, they were safe, which is not the case at all. Um, the truth to that is Ethiopia is going to be, compared to the rest of Africa, extremely advanced. Their economy is going to be very strong. Their technology is going to be extremely strong, right? They're going to have access to a lot of the weapons thanks to, you know, having good relationships with England and France. Um, but at this time in the 1930s, um, Ethiopia is not going to keep up with the times. And, and for the 1900s, right, for 1886, the weapons were good. But for now, they're extremely outdated. Uh, Mussolini is going to go all out to kind of prove to the, it's his country and to the rest of the world that he's legit. So he's going to use tanks and machine guns. And the worst thing was the poison gas. And he's just going to mow down Ethiopia. Um, here is, is going to be pretty much the first time that the rest of Europe is going to look at the League of Nations and say, hey, you really are good for nothing. You really can't do anything. This is going to make you know, Hitler just water at the mouth. He's going to be chomping at the bit. He's going to see what Mussolini does and, and the, um, just the, the no consequences they face for doing it. And he's going to go, yes, if he could do it, I could do anything, right? Japan's going to see this and say, whoa, if Mussolini could do this to Ethiopia and no one does anything about it, then no one's going to even bother to try to check us in the Pacific, right? So this is going to be really, really bad. This is going to be really, really bad. So now it's going to be a formation of the Axis powers. Germany, Italy, Japan were encouraged by the apparent weakness of the Western democracies. The three aggressor nations formed an alliance known as the Axis powers or the Rome, Berlin, Tokyo Axis. Right. Rome is the capital of Italy, Berlin, the capital of Germany, and Tokyo, the capital of Japan. Together, they agreed to fight Soviet communism and stay out of each other's imperialist ambitions. So that's good, right? I mean, it's not good, but their idea is a good idea, right? Japan, right, they're going to say, hey, leave us here, leave us in Asia, we'll do our own thing. They said, fine. Germany said, hey, Italy, go south to Africa, we'll leave you alone. Do whatever you want to do over there right? They're going to take over Libya, right? 
And they say, that's fine. And then Germany's going to say, hey, we're going to take care of the rest of Europe, right? They all agreed to it. They said, fine, that's cool, whatever it is, what it is. And then they ultimately, though, said, hey, we're both, all three of us are kind of scared of these guys, right? The communists. Because the way of thinking to their minds is terrible, right? And, and economically, it is terrible, right? It's never really worked. And they don't want that to happen. They don't want socialism to spread. Okay, so that's the one thing we're going to see. So they're go once again, class, they're going to create what we call the Axis powers. Now, a pattern of aggression. This is taken directly from the book. And here it pretty much just outlines in a chronological order what's actually happening about aggression and how they're going to start taking over bits and pieces. Right, now let's talk about the Spanish Civil War in Spain. General Francisco Franco, shown here, speaking to his troops, led the nationalist forces that overthrew the Spanish Democratic Republic. After his victory, Franco dissolved the Spanish Parliament and established a dictatorship. So let's talk about it a little bit more in detail. In 1936, Spain was plunged into civil war. Although the Spanish Civil War was a local struggle, it soon drew other European powers into the fighting. Both sides committed horrible atrocities. The struggle in Spain took more than 500,000 lives. One of the worst horrors was a German air raid on Guarnica, a small, a small Spanish market town. Germans timed the attack for an afternoon on a market day with thousands of people in town. German planes dropped a load of bombs and then flew low to machine gun anyone who had survived. Nearly a thousand innocent civilians were killed. Now, General Francisco Franco is, is going to be an absolute monster, right? Most of these people are. Mussolini was a monster, Hitler was a monster. Hideki Tojo, who we're gonna talk about later, who's gonna be the emperor of Japan. They're all, you know, just maniacs. Um, Francisco Franco is going to invite uh, Mussolini and Hitler to pretty much back him up, to give him um, legitimacy. And the Germans are going to see this as an opportunity to start testing what they would want to do to other nations, right? So they're gonna view this as pretty much practice. And it's terrible to say, but what they're doing here, the bombing and coming back and, and just machine going everyone, that's going to be a, a very primitive version of the Blitzkrieg. It's something they're going to do later, we'll talk about later, where they bomb cities and then they come in afterwards with tanks and they just level everything out. That's going to be called Blitzkrieg or Lightning War. Um, but the Spanish Civil War is going to be, you know, it's hard and terrible to, to think of it this way, but it's going to be pretty much like the playground for, for, these, for these European nations where they can start testing out a lot of their new weapons, they can start testing out um, a lot of their, their air forces and stuff like that. And of course, like we've always talked about class, who are the people who ultimately suffer the most, right? It's gonna be the innocent people. The people of Guanaca had nothing to do with Germany. They had nothing to do with the Spanish Civil War. They were just, right, it's just a normal day at the market Right. People are going to go in there trying to buy food for the day, just trying to survive. And they just get ruthlessly murdered. Right. This is going to be a, an attack that's pretty much going to live in infamy. Um, so much so that famous Pablo Picasso, probably the greatest artist of the last hundred years, um, Spanish individual, he was from Spain and he's going to create, you know, create, the scenes at Guanica. I was going to post pictures of, because there are pictures of the attack and it's just brutal. It's too brutal for me to even post on here. And so I decided that this was a very good representation of, of, of what it was. So as you could tell, right, here's a mother holding her dead child, right? There's a reason why all of these animals are just bits and pieces because they literally get blown up, right? If you can see here, right, I don't know if you can really tell, but He's, he's on fire, right? It, it's just absolute, just terrible, um, right? A broken sword, like, what, do, what do you think a broken sword, you know, represents? Class, right? It represents death, right? It represents something you can't protect yourself. You can't protect yourself with something broken, right? And so on and so forth, right? You can see the animals that are supposed to be in the market and, and the smoke coming off from the buildings and, and stuff like that where, where um, this is going to be considered one of the most powerful, right? Because it's coming from an actual event in history, um, very close to this art, you know, this artist's 
hometown, it's going to be viewed as a very powerful testament of, you know, anti-war, right? The horrors of war. Um, very powerful stuff to look at. And to continue with German aggression, right, it continues. In the meantime, Hitler pursued his goal of bringing all German-speaking people into the Third Reich. Class, we talked about what Reich means. We talked about it during, you know, the, leading up to World War, World War I, the German Reich, right, the German Empire. And he's going to continue what um, Otto von Bismarck is going to try to do, and he's going to try to justify going into other countries to try to free Germans, right? Just because you speak a language doesn't mean you're from there. Does that make any sense? Um, just because I speak Spanish doesn't make me Spanish, you know? Um, but he's not going to view that. That's just going to be an, an excuse to go into territories to free his people, right? Um, he also took steps to gain living space for Germans in Eastern Europe. Now, what does it mean by living space? Now, this is going to be a very controversial idea. The idea is that he's going to see Germany as being too small for his German people. He's going to say, hey, my people need more than just an acre of land, right? Each German, right, has a right to 40 acres of land. So we need more land. We need to expand our borders. And so, you know, I'm not, those numbers aren't those, you know, they're, they're not specific or you know, accurate. But you know what I'm trying to say is that he, he says, my German people need more land. We need to expand. We need more living space. That's going to be his excuse. Hitler, who believed in the superiority of the German people, thought that Germany had a right to conquer the Slavs to the east. Hitler claimed, I have the right to remove millions of an inferior race that breeds like vermin. Right? He's already starting his very nationalistic, his very um, you know, German supremacist ideas here. He's going to pretty much already say he's going to commit genocide on the Slavs. Right? He's going to remove millions of an inferior race. Um, and then to continue this, we're going to talk about the German act annexation of Austria, the Jet Crisis, and the Munich Pact. Now, Germany is going to annex Austria. By March 1938, Hitler was ready to engineer the Anschluss, or Union of Austria and Germany. Right? The Anschluss is the idea of combining these two countries. When Austria and Czech... Oh, let me fix this real quick. Let me fix this. Oh, let me go back. When... Austrian, Austria's, there we go. When Austria's chancellor refused to agree to Hitler's demands, Hitler sent in the German army to preserve order. Now, do you think he's actually going in there to preserve order or to pretty much invade? Right, it's the latter. He's going in there to invade. Of course, he's not going to say, I'm invading Poland, or I'm sorry, I'm invading Austria, because that would be bad, right? The rest of the world would be like, what are you doing? So he's going in there to preserve order. To indicate, Right, his new role as ruler of Austria, Hitler made a speech from the Hofburg Palace, the former residence of the Habsburg emperors. Right, class, Austria, the Austrian Empire is going to be known for the Habsburg, who ruled for generations, hundreds of years. Right, he's going to go there. It's going to be a metaphor, right? It's going to be symbolism saying, I am the one in charge now. Right, I'm going to speak from where your emperor spoke for hundreds of years. Right, that's a slap to the face to a lot of the Austrian people. The Anschluss violated the Treaty of Versailles, duh, but the West did nothing. So Hitler had his way and silenced any opposition to the annexation. So of course, there's going to be a lot of Austrians that are going to want to fight against this. A lot of Austrians are going to voice their concerns. They're going to complain. And what do you think is going to happen to them? What do you think is going to happen to the journalists that, that write articles saying this isn't, this isn't a good idea? What do you think happens to a lot of the, the, you know, the, the freedom fighters that are going to try to stop this from happening? They're, they're going to get murdered. Right. They're going to get eradicated. They're going to get taken care of, silenced. Right. And here he is at the Palace of Hofburg in March of 15th, 1938. Hitler gave a speech at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna announcing annexation of Austria by Nazi Germany. Now, the Jet crisis. Germany turned next to Czechoslovakia. At first, Hitler insisted that the three million Germans in the Sudetenland, a region of Western Slovakia, be given autonomy, right? So like we talked about before, the, the German Germanic language is gonna be something that goes beyond the border of Germany. So for example, Spanish, right? A lot of people speak Spanish outside of Spain, right? Cause it's a common language. Um, he's going to try to justify saying, hey, 
those 3 million people right next to Germany that speak German are Germans, when in reality, they're, they're not, right? But he's going to view this as an opportunity to, for him to go and start taking more land, right? He's going to try to increase his land. This is his excuse to do it, right? So he's going to do this to Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was one of the only two remaining democracies in Eastern Europe. The other one's Finland. Still, the Britain and France were not willing to go to war to save it. At the Munich conference in September 1938, British and French leaders again showed appeasement. They gave in to Hitler's demands and then persuaded the Czechs to surrender the Sudetenland without a fight. In exchange, Hitler assured Britain and France they had no further plans to expand his territory. All of this is known as the Munich Pact. So eventually, class, Britain and Germany are going to say, hey, you know what? We need to at least talk about what's going on with Germany. And they are. They're going to meet in Munich in Germany, the German Empire, and they're going to discuss Hitler's plans. They're going to go up to him and say, hey, you've already took over, right, the Rhineland from France. We let you get away with it. Right? We let you do so much things, right? You're, you're, you're breaking all of these Treaty of Versailles rules. What are you doing? And Hitler says, you know, he just justifies it by saying, you know, these three million Germans, they need to be freed. They need to be annexed, right? The German people need more land, yada, yada, yada. And England and France are going to kind of be like, well, okay, we'll, do you, we'll let you get away with it if you promise to stop. And of course, Hitler's going to promise to stop. Does he mean it? Mm, we'll see. Right, class? So this is what's going to happen. This is what Germany's going to look like. Initially, Germany's going to be this right here, all of this right here. This is going to be Germany after, right, in that, this brown right here after World War I, during the Treaty of Versailles. The first thing they're gonna do is they're going to take over the Rhineland here, right? This is gonna be the Rhineland. All of this right here. They're gonna take over the Rhineland. They're gonna start just taking more and more land. Now they're gonna annex Austria, right? They're gonna go into Austria and say, hey, you know what? You're part of our country now. Then they're gonna go into Czechoslovakia. They're gonna start taking over parts of Eastern Prussia and into Lithuania, right? They're gonna to try to start expanding wherever they can. They're gonna go all the way up to Denmark. Now class, there's a place here we haven't really talked about. That's Poland, right? So let's talk about it. World War II begins. Just as Churchill, Winston Churchill from England, right, the, the um, prime minister of England, predicted Europe plunged rapidly toward war. In March of 1939, Hitler broke his promises and gobbled up the rest of Czechoslovakia. So instead of just taking right where the three million people were, he took all of it. He absolutely took all of it, right? The democracies finally accepted the fact that appeasement had failed. At last, thoroughly alarmed, they promised to protect Poland, most likely the next target of Hitler's expansion. So, What's going to happen with Poland is that finally France is going to start putting troops into Poland. England is going to start putting troops into Poland. They're going to start giving them money. They're going to start giving them aid because they know more than likely that's Germans, Germany's next target. Before that, we need to talk about this surprise. Oh, don't, they, don't they look cute, cute little couple, right? It's a picture of Germany and right, the German Hitler and Soviet Stalin getting married. Now, why would they do that? Well, let's look. In August of 1939, Hitler stunned the world. Stunned the world. I'm sorry. Let me fix that. Right. Hitler stunned the world by announcing a non-aggression pact with the great enemy, Joseph Stalin, the Soviet dictator. Publicly, the Nazi... Soviet, not Sophia... Publicly, the Nazi-Soviet pact bound Hitler and Stalin to peaceful relations. Secretly, the two agreed not to fight if the other went to war, and to the two and the two divided Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe between them. So, what they're going to do, class, is they're going to get together and say, "Hey, look at you're scared of me. I'm scared of you. We're scared of each other. Let's make an agreement. Don't fight me. I won't fight you. Deal." deal. Okay, well, since we're not fighting, why don't we just divide up 50-50, the rest of Europe, right? Poland, Belarus, we'll figure it out. All right, the two divided Poland and other parts of the Eastern Europe between them, the pact was not based on friendship or respect, but on mutual need. 
Hitler, Hitler's fear of communism and Stalin's fears of fascism is going to take a pretty much the big reason this is happening. They're scared of each other, right? They're absolutely scared of each other. Instead of them teaming up, they're just going to say, hey, let's just leave each other alone, right? Because they don't want each other's people next to each other. Now, eventually, Germany does invade Poland with the blessing of Russia on September, the, on September 1st, 1939, a week after the Nazi Soviet. Why does it keep autocorrecting to Sophia? Ugh. The Nazi Soviet pact, Germany forced, in, uh, German forces invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany and World War II officially begins. So here's gonna be a newspaper from that day. It's gonna be the London Evening Standard in England, right? Germans invade and bomb Poland, Britain mobilizes. Warsaw, Krakow, and nine other towns bombed. Danzig is annexed. France declares a state of siege. Britain will fulfill her obligations, right? This is the last straw. This is when the last, right, the last straw to break the camel's back. This is what's really going to start the war. This is what's going to lead everything downhill. Okay, class. You know, here's your quiz. Go ahead and answer those in your notes. I'll give you guys a hint. Here's a hint. Here's a hint. If you're listening to this, which I know you're probably not at this point, I want you guys to email me, right? Email me with the subject of quiz, okay? Just quiz, subject quiz. And then for your body, I want you to put extra credit, All right? So subject quiz and then body, extra credit. Just email it to me, you'll get extra credit. The only people, Right, class? The only people who actually type it in and send it to me are going to get extra credit. Let's see how many of you actually watch this video. Because it's not looking like you guys are. It is what it is. I understand. Long videos. But let's see how many of you guys miss out on extra credit. You guys are going to have a quiz very, very soon. Okay? All righty, class. That pretty much wraps it up. Soon we're going to talk about the actual fighting. Okay? I'll talk to you guys very, very soon. But before, slap that like button. Subscribe like, I don't know. All right, guys, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.